you need to go, before you actually go into acquisition mode of buying the property, you need to work out whether or not you can actually turn a profit from the project. Because not every unrenovated property you can make a profit from. So what you're going to do is you're going to start to weed out the good deals from the bad. Now, um, obviously you've got your quick calculators, the high level feasibilities to basically work out if the property is stacking up initially. There is actually another calculator in that system that I've developed and it's what's called a cash affordability calculator. Now to be honest with you guys, this calculator, everybody struggles to understand this this calculator. So if you are struggling, certainly stick up the I need help flag. But let's go through this. Now what it does, it works out um, in terms of your cash affordability. It works out if you've got enough money to fund the deal from start to finish. Do you remember yesterday in the, when we covered the basics of renovating, I said normally what happens when you renovate an property, you get in, you strip it out, so you devalue it. And then as you start to put it all back together again, the, the property value increases. Remember I said you never want to be tripped out three quarters of the way through the project where you've run out of cash and you've come to a stalemate. So what this project looks at is make sure that you've got enough money to see you from the project from start to finish. Okay, so let's go through it. So if you turn to your manuals, you're looking for the cash affordability calculator. So it be, should be the template um, at the back of your step number four. All right. So it looks like that. It's in your workbook as well. Fantastic. So we're going to do that um, exercise. All right. So remember yesterday, basically yesterday, remember we did the resale calculator? Remember that? Okay. Now, with some of those costs up there, some of those costs you're actually going to incur in the project and some of the costs are going to come at the end of the project. Would you agree with that? Okay, so let's go through. So what this does, it, it just works out how much money are you going to need from the time you sign the contract and you pay your deposit, how much money you're going to need right to the very end until that basically hits, the money hits your bank account, the property settles. So first of all, your acquisition costs, your purchase costs. Now when you buy a property, typically on a normal bank scenario, you chuck in how much deposit? 20% deposit, okay? The banks will lend you 80%, you chuck in 20% deposit. If you go over that, if you have to chuck in less money, they'll charge you mortgage insurance. So for the purposes of this exercise, let's base it on just a normal loan, 20%. So the 100% doesn't become 100%, it becomes how much? 20. You need to chuck in 20%, okay? So 20% there. We'll, we'll write the figures over here. Now, do you incur your acquisition costs, your stamp duty and legals? Are they a project cost that you incur during the project? Yes. yes. Okay, so they are. So 20%, that one you incur. Your finance costs, your holding costs. So when your monthly mortgage repayments to basically pay for the property, do you incur those during or after the project? During. during. Now, unless you do some creative deal with the bank where you do like capitalised interest, where you can pay it all off the end. That's another option for you. So Paul will talk to you about that this afternoon. But in most deals, most loan scenarios, for a normal residential house, you'll be doing pay-by-the-month mortgage repayments. So you incur that cost during the project. You've also got professional costs. So for example, if you're going to outlay, um, you know, get a survey or some due diligence costs or whatever it may be, is that a cost during the project? Yes. yes. Your renovation costs, the actual money to fund the reno coming out during the project. Now, your resale costs, your agent's commission and your marketing fees, are they a cost that comes out during or after? After. after. So you don't have to worry about that one, okay? Because that, you basically can pay those agent's commissions and marketing when the property settles on payday. Okay, your capital gains tax, during or after? After. after. So you don't have to worry about that. Your profit margin, does that become during or after? After. after. You're the last one to be paid in the deal. So if you actually look at that, You've basically got for a cosmetic renovation, you've got 20, 24, 28, we'll come back to that, 38, 38, 38 and a half percent. All right. So what, you, what it says is that you've got 38 and a half percent in cost. Okay. Now, what you look at is you look at your cash. So does everybody understand that? Anybody not understand that? Okay, great. We're doing well with this class. I need a whiteboard assistant. Let's say you have $150,000 cash 
and that can be like cash in the bank, in your bank, your savings account. It can be equity in your current property. So if you own a house that's a million dollars and you only have a mortgage of five hundred thousand dollars, you've got five hundred equity there. Um, now you've also got. I'm just going to quickly divert for a second too, because does, does everybody know how to calculate their true net worth and their equity in their properties? Does everybody know how to do that? Anybody not know how to do it? Anybody want to know how to do it? Okay, so Paul might go through this afternoon. If you've got a property that's valued at a million dollars and you are a mortgage of, say, 600000 your true equity in that property is 400000 right? So if you sold the property and you paid out the mortgage, you'd be left with 400000 cash. That's real. So that's your real equity. However, usable equity from the bank is the bank always retain 20% buffer in case the market moves. So what they do is they take a million dollars and they take 20% off of that, which is 200,000. Okay, so that's their buffer to play safe. If you owe 600 and they want to keep the buffer of 200, it means it's 800,000, which your usable equity is only 200,000. Okay, so just don't get the don't don't think you've got four hundred thousand dollars to play with if you're utilizing an existing loan from one of your existing properties. Okay, um, so what it does, um, your usable equity can be your savings in the bank. It can be any equity that you have in existing investment properties that you can draw up. So get into the habit. If you're currently sitting, you only owe um, 70, 60%, you know, your, your loan to value ratio is only 60, 60%. What you should all be doing as renovators now is going and refinancing all your loan applications and basically maximizing, getting lines of credits for as much money as possible because you're going to take that money, the equity out of those properties, and you're now going to start to pour that into your property projects, okay? All right, so your equity can be from there. It can be if you sell your car and you get some cash or if you can borrow money from your family, friends, just any. It's basically just think of it as a pot of money. Now, let's say you've got 150000 equity, $150,000 cash in those equity, whatever it may be, at your disposal, basically funds that you can get from somewhere. What you do is you go 150000 divide... That, actually, this is wrong. It says 38. I forgot the, forgot the 0.5%. Divide 38.5%. If you don't want to factor that, that, zero, that professional cost in, just 38%. So what you do is you grab your calculator. You go 150,000 divide 38.5%. And what it's saying is that you can afford to buy property around the 389,000 mark. All right, so it's, does, this doesn't take into consideration your serviceability, so that's a different, entirely different thing whether you're not, you can actually service the loan. But what it's saying is that if you've got $150,000 in your bank, you can afford to be going buying an unrenovated property around 390000 and what it'll do is it'll actually give you enough money to cover that $150,000 in project cost. I'll, I'll flip the board around again just to illustrate that. Your 20% equity, so on a $390,000 house, 390 times 20% is 78,000 up here, right? That's your deposit that you've got to chuck in. Your acquisition costs on a $390,000 house times 4% are 15,600. This is 15,600. 390 times 0.5%. 1,950 for your professional cost. Uh, renovation cost, uh, 50,000. So what's that? Um, 390, 39,000. No cost there, no cost there, no cost there. So if we tally that up now, it should equate to 150,000. 78, 15,600, uh, 15,600, 1,950, 39,000. $150,150. Does everybody see that? Yeah. All right. So good check just before you sign on the dotted line is just to make sure that you're going to have enough money to basically do the project from start to finish. Does anybody not understand this? Because a lot of people struggle with this one. If you, if you don't understand it, wave your red flag. Okay. All right. So I'll quickly go through it again. So what it's looking at is what costs you're going to incur during the project. So we know that you, so you all understood that, which costs are coming out. 
So what it does, it looks at your equity. If you've got $150,000 at your disposal from whichever direction possible, just think of it as a pot of money at your disposable, at dis your disposal, sorry. You divide it by 38.5%. Where you get the 38.5% is this, 20, 24, 28, 28 and a half, 38 and a half. These ones you don't have to worry about because you're not outlaying that money during the course of the project. So that's where you get the 38.5%. Obviously, the structural figures are going to be different because they're higher percentages, so you're going to incur all of those, okay? So what you do is you know the costs are going to be 38.5% of costs that are going to be incurred during the project, and you divide that. Between, if you've got 150, divide 38.5. It means that you can afford to be buying property around the asking price of 390000 So you're still going and getting a mortgage for 80%, okay? That's still on the side. But this is looking at just what money you need to do the deal. So you can be afford to be paying, uh, buying property around the $390,000 mark with that 150000 cash. And that 150000 cash will pay f have, give you enough money to pay for the deposit, the acquisition cost, the finance, the professional, and the renovation cost. It will cover all of those expenses that you're going to incur during the project. Is everybody okay with that? Yeah. All right. So just make sure a quick little, because I would hate for you to run out of money during your course of your project. All right. We're going to do an exercise. So in your workbooks, if you can turn to your class exercise. For cash affordability, so I want you to work these figures out if you can. If anybody truly doesn't understand this, like put your hands up and one of my crew will come and explain it to you. Because uh, as I said, this is, this is the part of the system that a lot of people struggle with. All right, so in your workbook, you've got your cash affordability calculator. And what I would like you to do is I'd like you to calculate what cash you would need to do a property deal. Actually, my book says 150000 so that was a really bad figure I pulled out because that was actually the class exercise. Um, so let's work it out. If you've got $200,000 cash at your disposal, what property price can you afford to be buying property at for both a cosmetic and a structural renovation? So the figure, if you use the figure of 38% for a cosmetic, and use a figure of 75% for a structural. Okay. Anybody need more time? Okay, great. Let's do the let's do the answers together. So two hundred thousand. For a cosmetic reno, we're dividing it by what percentage? And for a structural it's divided seventy five percent. Okay. What figures have you got for 200,000? 519,480. Did everybody got that answer? 519,480 cents? Yep, great, which is just 200,000 divided 38.5%. And for a structural runner, we've got. That's a terrible number. 
$266,666. You can afford to be buying a property, an unrenovated property, if it's a structural, for $266,000. And then make sure you have enough money to see from the deal from start to finish. You don't run out. All right, step number four. Question back there? Sure, yeah. Just wondering, uh, what about getting construction loan for the, the renovation cost? Uh, that is built into all of that. So remember yesterday I said with the finance cost, it includes the um, initial purchase price finance and it also includes a construction loan cost as well. So if you read the little footnotes on the bottom of your resale calculator, it has all of that itemised for you. Yep. Okay, now in step number four, what you need to do is, um, first of all, when you're looking at seriously, um, uh, when you look at seriously um, putting... Uh, buying a property and analyse, uh, analysing the potential, what you need to do is you need to ask the agent about the vendor. If you can find out what the vendor's motiv motivations are for selling, then what it's going to do, it's going to put you in a good position to actually structure your offer to suit their needs. Otherwise, you're second guessing. You're trying to guess what their situation is. So get into the habit of saying to Chris, the agent, Chris, look, um, what's the reason for the vendors are selling? Now, some of them, if they don't know who you are from a bar of soap, they're probably going to give you some um, story that's not necessarily true they're just gonna say look they're gonna be selling they just want to sell they just want to move on whatever it may be if you have a good relationship with the agents I'd say the, their couple are actually getting divorced so um, I quite often get um, down to the truth of the matter of, as the real reason why people are selling because the agents know me and they respect me in my area so if you can do that what it's going to do is just uh, obviously give you the ability to be able to structure your offer so it perfectly suits their needs so they say yes okay We've spoken about buyer objections. There is a template in your manual for buyer objections. So obviously when you're going through your property inspection and it's at this stage, at step number four, where you sit down, you basically, you know, most of this you'll do from your home office or your office. And this is basically where you'll come through and you'll say, look, of those things that I've identified through the property due diligence and through my physical inspection of the property, these are the major issues that I'm basically facing with the property. Now, as I said, you might go through an unrenovated property and there's 10 buyer objections. It's, you know, the, the toilet's in the wrong location, the rooms are too small, the hallway's too cramped, there's um, no parking on the property, there's neighbours are horrible next door. So you're going to list down all the objections and what I want you to do is I want you to come back on that buyer objection. So you just, you know, print these out, print a lot of these templates out, have them ready at your disposal and don't think you have to type into these because it'll take you forever to do that. Just hand write stuff in as you're going through inspection and then if you've got 10 buyer objections listed on your thing, work out which ones you can solve. I can fix that, I can fix that, I can't fix that, I can't fix that. Yep, I can get rid of that. I can get rid of that. Whatever buyer objections are remaining, you need to look at how severe they're going to be and ask yourself, you know, if you were, the, if you were a buyer, would they basically be your reason why you, determ you buy a property or not? So obviously the more buyer objections, the better, but you want to aim for no buyer objections. So the best properties to buy are where there are 10 buyer objections and you can solve all 10. They're beautiful ones to buy. Because what you'll find is you'll find those de deals easier to buy because everybody just puts them in the too hard basket. So if you can do that, that would be great. Okay. Structural renos. It's important that if you are going at this stage... Oh, quick, take a quick question, sorry. sorry. Just while you're on, on the, uh, the numbers game now. Yes. I'm taking you back to yesterday, so yep. sorry for that. That's okay. The um, example that we did where we were doing cost of cosmetic yep. opposed to structural, yep. okay, and we were working out percentages and so forth. Yep. When we did that exercise, we did a sale price for both of them being at an end value of 1.2. Shouldn't the cosmetic have been at a lower end price? Because if you're doing the cosmetic mm -hmm. opposed to structural, you're obviously you're not going to get the same in sale price. So the figures were different for the resale calc one was four from memory one was four percent, one was five percent for the structural, is that what you're talking about? No. Okay, we did an example of buying a particular property. Yeah. Okay. And then doing the numbers on percentages to cosmetically renovate yes and then structurally okay yeah so in that example like the same house because then I, I sort of raise that part of if I'm going into the auction with you know Gabriella for example yep. and she's going in under cosmetic and I'm going in under oh, structurally yes, yes, remember remember that. Yep. yeah then she'd be 200,000 yes ahead of me yep but technically that end value when we were calculating the figures wouldn't be the same for her so the profit would be different 
So were yeah. we talking about the same house in that no, example no, 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 or two, just two. Well, as one's, one's, one's underutilised and one's u- fully utilised. So we were doing those as two totally different... It's, t- it's two different scenarios. So, oh, okay, um, not that we would Because she's not going to be... She, so in, in the cosmetic rental, you're only allocating 10% construction, so you're going to be limited in your construction with the cosmetic. You're not going to be obviously doing a full extent of works as you would do with the 40% of... So you're investing a lot more money in the structural renovation by the, you know, not 10%, 40%, and therefore you will have a much higher resale price. In the structure, correct. Yeah. So that, because in that ex- example, we use the end sale price as 1.2 on both, and that's where it just No, threw we me. didn't use the... No, no, we didn't. No, no, wasn't no, we didn't it? use the one. No, it wasn't 1.2 on the sale price. So the sale price would have been the purchase price plus 40 uh, times 42%. So what was the... Oh, was well, it? I misunderstood that then. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, no, it's two different, two different oh, right. sale yeah, prices. Really There's no way you're going to spend the same um, less money and sell it for the same price. Yeah, that's what I'm going. Yeah, no, yeah. so you've got a little bit um, mixed up. Oh, right, that's yeah. fine, but I come see me during the break. You. I'll come through. Yeah, I'll okay, take you through. Thanks. No issue. You. Um, okay. All right, structural renovations. Now, if you're going to do a structural and renovation, um, it is advisable in this stage, step number four, once you've done all the property due diligence and it's stacking up, it's advisable to bring an architect or a draftsman out on site as a quick check. Some, if you start to forge a relationship with your architect and they know that you're in the business of doing buying and selling properties, they'll actually come out on site for you for free. But as newbies to this game, they may charge you for that very first um, site, that very first site inspection. So it's okay to spend a hundred or two hundred dollars an hour whatever it is that an architect or a draftsman potentially would charge you. I, f- I think you'll find that a lot won't charge you because you're looking at basically buying that property anyway and doing a development application. But what you want to do is you want to get them out on site and you just want to basically go through the property. You know, my architect is named Steve and I just say, look, Steve, looking at buying this property, um, what I'm thinking of basically doing is what I've identified the scope of work is to basically put a two-storey extension through here, an alteration at the back, bringing it out to this building line zone here, um, blah, blah, blah. Do you think I'll have any issues with that. Now, um, that's I don't have to do that these days because I pretty much know what can be done to a property, obviously doing it for a period of time. But as new newcomers to this game, you may not know all those building controls. So it is worth getting an architect, a professional, because you may think you can come and put a two-storey extension on, but you may not realise there's some height controls there that don't allow you to do that. So even if you come have to come down one metre, it could be the difference between having a 2.4 metre ceiling, which is the minimum, as opposed to like a 1 point or a 1.4 metre metre ceiling which is not going to be habitable so it's worthwhile in your very early days as a professional renovator to bring that consultant your design consultant out and double check on that for you all right is it worth the 100 or 200 dollars to get it right particularly if you're doing a structural of course it is Okay, FSI. Now, we've spoken about floor to space ratio yesterday. I'm going to cover that now because this is a really important thing in terms of adding value to a property if you're going to be a structural renovator. Who wants to be a structural renovator? Okay, great. So what it is, as I mentioned yesterday, it's looking at the density of a property. So you look at your block of land and basically you calculate how much is going to put. So we're going to do this exercise because for me as a renovator, when Chris, the real estate agent, poor Chris, when Chris, the real estate agent, rings me, it's a prompt surprise he calls me actually, uh, when he rings me and says, Cherie, uh, number, you know, Yule, five, number five Yule Street's come on the market in Balmain. I jump straight onto RP Data. I pull it up, go onto Google Earth, fly over, have a look. And basically the first thing I do is I basically try and, you know, get the floor plan, download it from the internet, whatever it may be, and calculate what the actual square meter of the house is. So what this one does is it's looking at how much house are you allowed on your land. Now, in, some, in most states of Australia, and pretty much all over across Australia, they do typically refer to this as floor-to-space ratio. In some councils, they call it um, the residential density control, um, and some other places call it as uh, like gross uh, floor area gross floor area. So there's a couple of different terminologies depending on which council, as I said, you think in Australia they would call the same thing the same thing for consistency purposes, but they don't. So if you've got, a, if you look at this example here, if you've got a 450 square metre block of land and the FSR in your area is 0.7 to 1, so they always express it as a, a like a 0.7 to 1 a percentage, but in some councils, i.e. Brisbane City Council or the Brisbane people, um, Brisbane City Council is the main council in Brisbane, they actually don't express it as a percentage. There's actually a formula and it is it can be a little bit more difficult to work this out. My experience with Brisbane City Council, just for all the Brisbane people in the room, is that 
getting this information out of council is going to be like extracting blood out of a stone. So what I would suggest you do then is actually go to your local, just ring up a local architect or a local draftsman and ask them typically what is the residential density control in this area and they, you'll get a much quicker answer through a local design professional rather than your local council. Um, all right, so what you do is you've got a 450 square metre block of land in your council they basically will give you the control. So what I encourage you all to do, once you've chosen your one to three target suburbs, what are you going to ring in council and ask? Floor to space ratio. What is the floor to space ratio in my suburb? And get them to give you what that percentage is. So sometimes I'll say it's um, 0.7 to 1 plus 20, 20 square metres or something, but you just it, it's the formula. They'll just give you the formula. Now 0.7 is obviously the percentage. The 1 represents what? the block size. Okay, so if you've got a 200 square metre block, what that equation, well in this case it's a 450 square metre block, so it's 0.7, 70% of 450. So, 700, so, four, so you grab your calculator, you go 450 times 70% will give you 315 square metres. Now at the moment, we know the building the total area of the house. So it's if you've got a subfloor, you've got a bottom level, you've got a ground level and you've got an upstairs story, it's the individual area of each individual floor all combined together. So you don't just take the whole massive house, you've got to count the individual rooms floor by floor, okay? Now some councils will include a thing like something like a garage included in the control. Some councils, in my council, Leichhardt, they even count a carport. They basically say in Leichhardt, anything with the roof, is included in the floor to space ratio. So be smart about what you design um, and how you design your buildings because you want obviously try and get as much house as you can with, with on possible on your site without detracting from the site in any way, shape or form. So um, what it's saying is that this house is currently 220 square metres. We know that we're allowed to get 315 square metres under the current controls of house. Therefore, it means that you can get an extra 95 square metres of additional area. Now, is that a structural renovation opportunity? Yeah. Absolutely. If you did that control, you did some measurements and the ba house is basically saying that you can get an extra 16 square metres of additional floor area, are you going to bother? Because you know, a normal room, a four by four room is 16 square metres, okay? You want to be getting at least, at the very minimum, 30, 40 square metres as an absolute minimum as a structural renovator. Anything less than that, you are going to struggle to recoup your cost, okay? So make sure you always do that check. All right. Um, so what I want to do is I want you to work through an example. Now how you do this, so you're going to come home from the open for inspections, you've just seen an unrenovated house on an underutilised block, so these houses sit everywhere, so you're going to quite often just go into houses where, you know, normal block of land, houses sitting like that, and that's it. Big backyards, have you seen those properties that got big backyards? Beautiful for structural renovations. You go in and basically, so the first thing when you come through that, you go through the inspection, you can say, yeah, it's unrenovated. Even the house, sometimes the, the opportunities are, like don't think an unrenovated property has to be a derelict shack falling over. Sometimes you can go in just a normal house, you know, one of those post-war homes sitting on an underutilised block. The actual front house is actually in okay condition where you might just be able to cosmetically freshen it up with paint and stuff like that. But you have a real opportunity. So you keep literally everything from the front, you just freshen it up and you come through and you add on to the house and you build a new extension to the rear. So don't think you always have to do major cosmetic renovations to a house in its entirety, okay? You don't want to spend more money where you have to. So let's do this exercise. So what you're going to do, you're going to go to the open for inspections, you're going to see some property, you're going to see a house, come on, let's say this one, 19 Days Street. It's in your, you've got this in your workbook, so if you can turn to your workbooks, because I want you to calculate this, I want you to understand how to do this, because this is absolutely critical if you're going to assess a property from a structural renovation perspective. So if you can turn to your little workbook to the 19 Days Street. So let's assume you've just gone to an open for inspection, you've just seen this property half an hour ago, you're thinking, oh, this, you know, it's a bit tired. It's grandma's house. This was a property that was on the market about six to nine months ago, I think, in Sydney or August. When was that? Time flies here, yeah, almost a year ago. So, and it's got the floor plan. Now, this is why you need to collect these agents' brochures because you need the floor plan. In order to calculate what the house is currently, you need the floor plan. Now, sometimes you get lucky and the brochures actually have 
the, um, the measurements on them, okay? But most times they don't. So what I want, ignore the fact that there's actually a calculation there at the moment, but I, what I want you to do is I want you to work out currently what this house is in terms of the, what floor, the floor to space ratio of this house is at the moment. Now we know from the front of the brochure, it's saying the site area is how much? 188 square metres. See that on the floor plan? Everybody see that? Okay. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to go through, and I want, so ignore the fact that it's on the brochure, but I want you to basically go through and I want you to tally up what the individual areas of the house is. So let's do bedroom one together so you know how to do this. So you grab your calculators, and so if you can take out this, this little template, which is called floor to space ratio. See this one here? This is actually a template to help you work it out. So this should be in your workbook. It's in your workbook. It's also in, it's in your manuals, but it's also in your workbook, okay? So if you scribble on this in your workbook, this is going to help you work it out. So, guys, let's fill out this. Let's do this together. Your land size. How much is your land size? 188. So that you write 188 in that top line of the floor to space calculator. All right? The floor to space ratio, now in Leichhardt, the FSR, the floor to space control, is 0.7 to 1. So what percentage? So you write 0.7 in the one box. Is everybody doing this? Okay, cool. The allowable FSR. In Leichhardt, in my council, the allowable FSR is 0.7 to 1. So work out what that is. So what you do is you go the land size, grab your calculators, go land size 188 times 70%. So write down whatever figure you get, which is what? One. Okay, so 131.6 square metres. That's, that's the amount of house you are allowed on that block of land. So we lost anybody yet? Okay, good. All right. Now, the current house, you need to determine what the current house is. So can I now get you to get the floor plan? Don't write in there the figure that you know what it is. Just grab the floor plan. And what I want you to do is I want you to individually tally up what the areas of the house is. So let's do bedroom one together. The bedroom, the very front room at the front of the house. See, so it says bed 3.7 times 3.7. So what you do on your calculator, you go 3.7 times 3.7 gives you... 13.69 square metres. So that front bedroom is 13.69 square metres. Now see how the hallway doesn't have any dimensions? Sometimes on these floor plans you have to make a rough guesstimate, but the easy way to do it is if you look at it, we know that on this length here is 3.7, right? We know the bedroom over here is 3.7, so I know the length of that room from there to there is, what, 7.4? And what's the average length, the average width of a hallway? About a metre, 1.2 1, 1 on average. So you go 7.4 times 1.2, and that'll actually give you the dimension of the hallway. So that's how you do guesstimates. You try and look for other, me other measurements within the floor plan that can give you the area of that, er that space. What's that, lounge? Yep. So there you go. That's the measurement you're looking for. See that? So the lounge is 4.7 across. So we know that hallway is exactly one metre. So you just look for other measurements on the floor plan. So what I want you to do is I want you to now go and tally up to try and get as close as possible what the dimensions of that whole house are. So obviously if you have a single, a single level house, you do that. If you've got a two-storey level, you'll have to tally up all the single area, then tally up the storey above as well. So the, the thickness of the walls do, does, doesn't, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. No. Does it matter for this exercise or does it matter to the company? Well, most walls. I mean, you just want to get the actual floor area, so the wall's not really irrelevant. I mean, if you wanted to get that precise, but you're probably, you're probably only talking like very minimal distances. Most walls aren't a metre wide. Um, they're only very thin, so it's marginal.
keep moving forward. So what's the average, what do you think the house is sitting at at the moment? So it's around the 80 mark, somewhere, it like, doesn't matter if it's within a couple of square metres, it doesn't matter, right? As long as you get very clo fairly close. So at the moment it's around 80 square metres for the current house. See how the agent's brochure says 82.9? So that could be a little bit out. So the current house is 80 square metres. Is an increase in the FSR possible? Yes. By how much? So what you do is you go 131.6, which is the allowable. The current is 80. That means what's the increase? We can get a structural renovation of what? 51.6, roughly, somewhere around there, 50 square metres. Is that a structural renovation opportunity? Absolutely. All right, so that's the very first check. For any properties for a structural renovation, if you can grab the floor plan, work out whether that's a deal or not, that's what you do for structural renovations. All right. So the more you can start practising that, the better, okay? It's just, a, it's just practice. I can do that with my eyes closed. It takes two seconds, but obviously the more practice. So start doing that exercise, even for properties you're not even interested in at the moment that come on the market and you own, just start practising all these things. So when it comes time when you've got a deal, you know how to do it. Hi, Sheree. Hey. I think the calculator's great, but the only thing that it's not taking into consideration is the setbacks. Because in Melbourne in particular, yep. I don't know about Sydney, but in Melbourne they're really particular about setbacks. Uh, everywhere all over Australia they are. So how do you take into consideration And that's why you need to get your architect out on site. So you'll basically do this first up. You'll know that you can get 51 square metres and that's where you bring your architect out on site and look, I know according to the floor to space ratio I can get an extra 50 square metres. Are we going to have any issues going up, out, sidewards, backwards, all that sort of stuff? So would you um, look at the setback and minus the setback from the actual usable space then? That's Would what you your architect that? does. You don't need yeah. to get down to that level, that's what your architect does. Okay, yep. thanks. Uh, yeah, the DCP tells you that as well, absolutely. So knowing that, knowing that most probably is going to have a 900 mil setback, I mean obviously the further out you go that gets a lot, re lot relaxed. So the challenge will be is for you to then basically come through and put a 50 square metre that complies with those height, the side setbacks, the rear setbacks and also the height setbacks. Now in some suburbs, guys, um, in some suburbs, in some councils, you are allowed to go over the FSR if it doesn't have any impacts on anybody. For everybody coming out to my site inspection next week, when I bought my current project, it was 0.64%. Uh, um, so 64% of the land had been utilised. In Leichhardt, the control is only 0.5 to 1, so you're only allowed to develop 50% of the land. I bought the property at 64%. I put a development application through and I'm currently sitting at 94%. So you would think going to, the, if you did that initial FSI, you would think that, hey, I can't, this is not a structural renovation because it's already over the allowable FSR. But councils will actually let you go, and this is sort of not really published anywhere, sort of I just know this from being in the game, but you are allowed to go over the FSR if it doesn't have any impacts on anybody else, if it doesn't negatively impact um, your neighbours in any way, shape or form. So the way that you can do that is quite often if you buy a property, um, if you want to, like for example, if you've got a property, a house, and you want to come through and build like, you know, excavate part of the land away and maybe build, un you know, build underneath the house like that where the neighbours can't see it. Um, one of my developments, I was able to get a whole complete floor underground um, because you couldn't actually see it from the street. So I got an extra 100 or so square metres just by excavating down into the land. It couldn't be seen. So those sorts of things, that's where you can go way over the FSR because it doesn't negatively. So I don't think it's a hard and fast rule. There are some variances there. Oh, hi, Cherie. Hey. Um, just with that particular example, the backyard is about 70 square metres. Mm -hmm. If you were going to add 50 square metres, would like council say it has to be... So like it has to comply. Story? Yeah, so it has to comply. So that's the challenge of your architect. You know that under the control you're allowed to get an extra 50 square metres and then the challenge for your architect is make sure it complies with the height, the control, the setbacks and the landscaping ratio so you've got 40% of open space or whatever that control is in your local council. That's what you're paying your architect to solve that problem. Thanks. Yep. My question follows on from that about hard stand for the landscaping perspective. Yep. Will the architect know that or will that be in the Yeah, council? architect knows all. That's, that's our court architectural due diligence. So the same way as you as pr um, 
as property developers will do all your property, your suburb due diligence, your architect goes exactly the same process and does his or her architectural due diligence. And that's all part of that side setbacks, building line zone, all sorts of things. Uh, when you um, managed to push that ratio out to 90%, mm -hmm. you're taking quite a risk, aren't you? No, none. I mean, how did you know in advance that you were likely to get that? Well, for that house, uh, and you'll see when you come out to the house, the house already has a fairly big <coughs> building footprint on it. So I was able to, with that property, uh, my current project, I was able to take out a lot of walls internally. It was a very disjointed floor plan. No, I've and I've that. come through yeah. and I've uh, taken out, you know, all the open space. So I've remodeled the house to become mu much more functional. I also added the first floor addition. I recessed that into the roof cavity. So it really has no impact. So just to give you an idea, guys, for the guys that can't through, on my current project, it looks, it pretty much looks like that, where you've got your front cottage to the rear, it actually had another sort of middle X part and then it had actually had a barn um, at the back of the property. So what I've done is I've come through and it was a series of rooms, just all sorts of rabbit warrens of rooms and the barn was a barn. So what I did is I actually connected the barn to the house, there was a one metre gap separating, so I, I, I filled it in there, so I've got some additional area there. I actually increased the balcony um, it had an overhead walkway, so I actually pulled the house out because it already had a roof that was already counted in the FSR, so that meant I could remodel the house. And I also built in, um, so the roof, the roof sort of went like that, uh, sort of thing. Um, and what I did is I came in and I um, dug into the roof cavity, so I put an extension just 100 millimetres below the ridge board, and I came through and just did a very small extension to the rear there, and I was able to get a whole complete first floor bedroom in the roof cavity, which basically had the main bedroom, bathroom, and a, big, a huge big wardrobe by utilising the existing roof cavity. So these are some of the ways we're going to start to talk about now how to add value. You can't actually see it from the street, so therefore it has no impacts on anybody, and that's where you can go over the FSR. All right, let's get stuck into the ways that you can add value. Okay, so we're going to look now at um, all the ways, 140 ways. We're going to move through this fairly quickly. Um, so we're going to look at, first of all, what are the internal cosmetic improvements? So if you're buying a cosmetic reno, what's the stuff that you can do internally to add value to it? What we're going to do is we're going to do and identify all the ways. There is a checklist in your system for this. It's called the Adding Value Checklist. All right, and it's done on a room by room basis. So I'm going to I'm going to make you aware of all the things you can do. You're going to go through in your property inspection and go, okay, tick tick tick, I can do this. And then you're going to come back with your fi financial feasibility, and you're going to work out which ones are going to add the most value and which ones you can afford to do. Because you might get 200 things on this list that you can do to the property, but you may not. You may only be able to afford to do 100 of them. So you need to pick out the big things that are going to add the most value. All right, so let's move through this fairly quickly. Okay, first one is repaint the interior. Out of all the things you do, and the, if you've got a very tight budget, your number one priority is paint. I love paint. I would bath in the stuff if I could. It will basically make a huge improvement to any property. So you look at properties like this, right? Um, lots of yellow paint, um, cream, um, light blue was a great colour over the last 30, 40 years, the paint, and pink, okay? Pink, peach, all those beige colours, they're horrible. They just make it probably look dated. So you're going to come through properties like this where they just look tired, the paint colour makes it look tired, and just by coming in and giving it a fresh coat of paint, it makes it look completely new with a little bit of styling, okay? You know, properties like this, Hor would you agree, horrible room? Yeah? Bit drab, it's not really the sort of room that you want to be in. Um, what about now? Paint. Nothing has been done to that room but paint, okay? So it's cheap, um, it's very low skill level. Okay, here's another house, okay? Um, obviously not all these images aren't, a lot of them aren't mine, but they're just for the purposes of illustration. Okay, you can see they've come through and they've painted, they've just light and brightened the room. So what paint does is it just lightens and brightens rooms. This is just a very average sort of house. Um, coming through and they've just um, painted, painted some different colours to spruce it up. I don't particularly like white paint. Um, white is quite, so be careful. It's so much easier and so much cheaper for you to come through and paint all your properties white because you don't have to worry about cutting in lines and things like that. So I'd say if you're on a really, really tight budget on a low value property, knock yourself out, paint the whole house white. But I tend to feel it's a bit sterile. Um, and it can look a little bit bland. So I do strongly recommend that you follow my cookie cutter templates. They're tried, they're tested. If they work for me, they'll work for you. And they're certainly working for hundreds of students right across the whole country. So definitely go and get those sample pots. And you repaint everything, the window frames, the doors, anything you can paint, paint everything, okay? Because it can, it can, this is where you can save a lot of money, not having to take out stuff that really doesn't need to be taken out. 
Okay, so your aim is with paint is to lighten and enlarge rooms, okay? All right, strategy two, rip up and ditch the old carpet. You're going to be going through a lot of properties where um, the carpet is just horrible, it's grungy, it's one of the first things I rip out. In fact, you know what, I, went, I did an office renovation, not last week, the week before, and I had this ugly um, dark green carpet with this, like, this red embellishment. And uh, I finished the renovation, I was actually just doing the construction clean on the end of the day, and um, the tenant next door, the, the owner of the office said, hey, he was very proud, he said, come and have a look at my new renovation, my new office renovated, and the guy next door came and said, what happened to the green carpet? And um, he said, oh, we took it out because we put floorboards in. And he said, I really like that green carpet. I think you've actually made a big mistake. Um, these floorboards um, look horrible. That green carpet was really nice. I'm like, oh, no, oh God, I'm still living in the 60s. But anyway, um, so you see here, like this is, this is um, now how not to renovate your house, okay? They've just obviously been re watching a renovation show or whatever or just got absolutely no idea. But you're just going to be dealing with this house, even, if, even though the paint colours are horrible, um, you know, even just by ripping up that ugly blue carpet and just putting some lighter floorboards is going to sp instantly spruce that property up. Okay, install new floor coverings. So this can be the floorboards, carpets and tiles. Now for low budget cosmetic renos, there's an um, absolute great range these days of low cost laminate flooring. I'm starting to use them a lot in some of the real cheap renovations that I've done. So I've done two low budget renos this year. I've just been doing a few renos this year just for the purposes of filming for all my graduates. Um, so I've just renovated the um, commercial office, which I will we'll get the footage to at some stage of that, and also the low budget cosmetic reno. So um, there's a great shop in Sydney, it's called m and flooring um, in Auburn. If you want the details, phone our office. You can go in there and get uh, laminate floorboards for about $35 a square metre, supply and installed. Absolutely fantastic. So you don't have to spend copious amounts of money on floor covering. You've really got to shop around. This is uh, one of my students' projects. So this is the sort of stuff you're going to be dealing with, okay? So don't be scared on these sorts of properties. This is so easy to renovate this house. It's not funny. I could do this with my eyes closed. So is this carpet grungy? Yeah, because she's come in and she's put um, timber laminate flooring. Instantly modernizes that property, okay? So um, I'm big. Uh, most people don't like carpet these days. Even in my renovations, I keep one consistent flooring material. So what you want to aim for in your renovation is one consistent flooring material. Either, either go floorboards or you go lino or you go tiles or you go carpet. Don't put carpet here, tiles there, lino there. So it's a hodgepodge. One, because you, what you want to do is you don't want to break the flow of um, the break the flow around the whole house. So try and aim for one floor material right throughout. Question I'm there? Sorry, you're going to ask, that you've just answered mine in a way. We've got a, kit, a house and we've done all the timber floors. Now we've found that the back area, which is like that area at the yep. back with the table, uh, you can't polish it and whatnot. It's, it's too far gone. We are thinking we should actually tile that and then tile the kitchen area so it's all one, becomes one area, but separate from the rest of the house, which is all polished timber. Real, real floorboards or laminate floorboards in the rest of the house? The real floorboards. So you could um, just potentially put new floorboards for the cost. The same. It's going to cost you exactly the same for tiles, um, labour. It's going to cost you exactly the same. Yeah, but we're pulling, we're pulling the wall out as well and all that sort of stuff. And yep. So you can, that, can, be, can, that can be filled in. Yeah, okay. So problems, what do we do with problems, Tim? I'm eating them. <laughs> Good. All right. What I typically say is with your floorboards, aim for darker floorboards rather than lighter floorboards. If it's a larger house, if it's an extremely small house, err on the lighter side, okay? Because what you want to do is you want to open up prices. Um, particularly when you're moving into a more expensive properties, you want to go into a darker floorboard. Darker floorboards have higher perceived value than lighter floorboards. When you've got a lighter floorboard, people think they're cheap laminate flooring. So great colours are the red, I like the iron bark or the darker colours, and you want to aim for high gloss polish okay so your objective with your renovations is to have everything sparkling and shining so when it comes to your architraves your skirting boards your floorboards your cabinetry gloss 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 all the way your painters will come in and say shuri don't paint your skirting board um, gloss paint paint it matte or satin and they're saying that for a reason because matte or satin paint actually hides defects gloss enhances those defects but as a renovator you want everything to sparkle okay so gloss gloss all the way Okay, change the window furnishings. You're going to come in and you're going to buy, like, Nanny loves lace curtains, okay? Now, the reality is so you're going to be dealing with lots of things like this. What are you going to do with these curtains, renovators? Throw them in the bin. Oh, who said throw them in the bin? <laughs> no, you sell them. 
eBay. No, I've actually developed a template for you. You don't actually have this in your manual, but on your templates, this just recently, I created the demolition signs for you, demolition sales signs for you. So they're actually on your templates disk right now. So there's actually quite a few things on your templates disk that aren't printed out in the manuals. But what you want to do is go and get a sign printed. Your artwork is on that disk right now, so you don't have to pay a graphic designer to do that. And basically get one sign. You only have to get one sign made once. And then basically when your construction, when your temporary fence goes up or as you're doing the strip out, hang on the front fence, demolition, so I think it says demolition sale, items for sale, see inside or whatever it is that is on that disc and um, people will actually come. So they'll buy your old doors, they will even, believe it or not, they will buy the lace, the lace, the curtains always sell. Some person will come and buy your furry blue curtains that you've just ripped out of your unrenovated house. People will actually come and buy that carpet, believe it or not. So what they do, there's a lot of cheap landlords around um, who have rental investment properties. It doesn't matter. You might only get 30 bucks for that big slab of carpet there, but guess what? It's $30 in your f in coming into your feasibility, not going out. So that $30 pays for half a blind, cheap Venetian blind somewhere else. So it all adds up. So quite often when I sell, when I'm doing the strip out of my projects, I stockpile everything together. In fact, I just stockpiled a whole heap of stuff um, just on Friday from one of the sites that I've just did. And... Um, Doors, uh, windows, old security doors, um, the oyster light fittings, the blinds. You would be amazed at what stuff you actually rip out from your renovation project and get that um, quantity surveyor in to do the scrapping schedule so you can write all those costs off. So, um, yeah, never under underestimate. So sell everything. So in your financial feasibility, there's a section there for re um, sale of demolition items. So you factor all that stuff in. On my current project, it had um, th I ripped off the terracotta tiles. They were horrible colour. I ripped them off. I actually advertised them in the trading post, 3,360 terracotta tiles. I had somebody come in who actually paid me a dollar a tile and they sent all their crews in. They took them all off for me. Three, I'd rather, I could have chucked them in the mini skip bin and cost myself $2,000 in tipping cost, or I could have sold them and got the money back into the revenue. So don't underestimate what people spend. Bye. Yeah, so a scrapping schedule. So all the fixtures and fittings that you're going to rip out of your property, you can um, potentially depreciate, write them off. So that's with your accountant. Uh, sorry, quantity surveyor, ring up a quantity surveyor, ask for a scrapping schedule, and they will basically write all those items off. And basically, when you finish the renovation, you bring them back in again, and they'll do a new depreciation schedule so you can start claiming all the depreciation on the new fixtures and fittings that you've put in. All right, so you're going to be like, very common, would you agree? You're going to come through and deal with this? Curtains actually drag down a property, so I've never used curtains in any renovation, saying that curtains have, curtains have made somewhat of a comeback, um, particularly in more expensive design, like designer apartments and things where you've got all these beautiful sheer curtains. So I think there is a time and a place for curtains, but in most renovations that most of you are going to do, you're either going to be doing slimline Venetians, which are very, very cheap, um, or plantation shutters or roller blinds. Um, please avoid vertical drapes. They look horrible. It doesn't matter what colour they are. They just Whoever invented those should be shot. And um, your way to go is slim, slimline Venetians, which are very, very cheap. Or as I said, your plantation shutters for a little bit more expensive properties. Did you all get my plantation shutter video a couple of weeks ago? Okay. So um, just follow those. So always just think tight budget, really, really shop around. I just want to know about sliding doors. What what furnishings put in there? Roller blinds. Oh, roller blinds. Yeah. So just a roller blind above, and they can come down. And roller blinds are so cheap; it's not funny. So I just did a house uh, last year with roller blinds, and I, it cost me about a thousand dollars for a very big span of about ten meters. So really, really cheap. Okay, so you can see here, curtains, I just don't like them. I mean, obviously, even just the colour, your colour of your blinds is a big um, thing. So with your renovations, you're aiming for light and bright, so please don't ever try and, like, for example, if you're going to paint your, your a feature wall, don't put dark blinds. You want to put white, as light as possible. You know how you can get those timber blinds, uh, the, like the natural timber look? Please don't use any of those because they don't look great. You always, if you are going to use the cheap, um, timber blinds, always make sure you use white ones, okay? So lighter, lighter, lighter wherever possible. Um, in my opinion, you want to get as rid, rid of as many wooden surfaces as possible and paint everything. Okay, update, change the light fittings. There's so many cheap light fittings and beautiful light fittings on the market. I would all recommend that you go to those cheap 
um, lighting stores that you see. Uh, you know, like those, those bargain lighting places, big sort of factory places, they are everywhere. Particularly in the outer suburbs, you tend to find them. In the inner city locations, you're going to pay a premium for lighting. So quite often as a renovator, what I do is I do a lot of my shopping in the outer suburbs. Like for me, in, being in Sydney, I shop in the outer west a lot. So I go to like Good Guys, I'll go to um, Lighting Town at Auburn, I go to Royal Tiles at um, Auburn. So I tend to go in those outside locations where it's more budget territory. When you start coming into the inner city locations where there's more affluent prices, they have more designer items and basically higher prices. So shop outside in the outer suburbs to get maximum price. Okay. Install feature lights. Now, I'm really big on installing feature lights, even for a low-budget cosmetic reno. You want some element of wow factor in your property. It doesn't matter if it's a $3 million house or a $300,000 house. You need to get buyers saying, oh, that looks nice. Oh, that looks nice. That looks really good. Blah, blah, blah. So how I do that is with feature lights. This is a low-budget reno that I did in January. It was a $340,000 house. I spent $30,000 on the whole renovation inside and out, and it was revalued at between four hundred and twenty dollars to four hundred and sixty. dollars So what I did is I put some really low budget feature lights. So this is just a classic example. That This was a feature light that was bought from one of those cheap little lighting stores. This one was $169. I actually just, in the latest renovation, in fact, I'm actually going to do a little video on this. Um, in the office renovation that I did last week, the, it was a really tight renovation budget, $10,000 for the property for the renovation and styling, including the furniture, so I had to buy the sofa and everything. So I literally had about $7,000 to spend on the whole renovation. So what I did is, um, and I had to put four, I basically identified where four feature lights could go. And I went to Ikea. Now, Ikea actually had these... Um, weird uh, lights and I actually during the next spread I might even try and get a picture up on the internet I'll show you these exact lights but they were just a flat feature light and they were made out of straw like yellow straw the color wasn't very nice they were $169 each so they were the right shape and stuff what I did is I went to Bunnings I got a tin of uh, white spray paint I sprayed them it took about 10 minutes each light and they looked fantastic so you can get really creative with your with your lights for those sort of straw materials and things like that that you see around. So if, what I do with feature lights, for example, if I'm actually, um, if I'm looking over a student's plans or whatever, can I actually have one of the crew members as a whiteboard um, scrubber rubber? Okay, so if I'm, um, if I'm looking over somebody's floor plan, which quite often we do that, that's the service that we offer to you as, as part of your workshop mentoring. If you're going, to, going through your projects, we encourage all of you to send your floor plans through or just any of your design diagrams so we can make sure you've got things in the right place. Quite often I'm dealing, thanks Helen. Helen's a graduate, she's doing, a, she's doing her renovation at the moment. Okay. Um, quite often you'll go through, most houses, you know, either have like a hallway to one side or in the, you know, sometimes you get a, a, an entry through the side here, like your entry might be on the side of the property, but a lot of properties tend to have a, gut, a hallway right through the guts of the property. So what I typically say with feature lights is that you want a feature light right at the very front of the property. So when you open the front door, you basically see a feature light. Um, pretty much is install a feature light at key focal areas. Now, if you're going to do feature lights, make sure you use the same feature light right through the whole property. Don't go put a crystal chandelier here and then some sort of modern drum light through here because it'll look like a hodgepodge, a hodgepodge of ideas. So you want consistent themes right through the whole house. So I'd put, like for example, that drum light through here and then when you've got your galley kitchen through here or whatever it may be, you put the same feature light but a baby version of it. So you can buy quite often these feature lights you can buy small medium large sizes whatever they may may be so you want to do consistency okay so if i can get you to keep rubbing as i go thank you all right so this is see how in the same house over the bedroom this is the main bedroom just to put a little bit of wow factor i've used exactly the same light a smaller version and i've just placed it over the bed over both sides of the bedroom um, in a very low cosmetic reno do you like that or not you think it's horrible? it's actually uh, it, it, the colors aren't blue it just looks blue in the photo but it's just a very cheap way to get money somebody coming and going oh that actually looks quite nice okay 
install, install better quality uh, skirting boards and architraves. So you're going to go through a lot of houses, particularly the houses out in the country areas and the metropolitan areas where they've got very thin skirting boards. Have you ever seen that? Those thin skirting boards look cheap and nasty. They actually they make your property look like it's got lower, uh, just like a lower quality level. And it is because they're a project style sort of architrave. So a great way to add value to a property is actually to rip those skirting boards and architraves off and actually install slightly wider skirting boards and architraves. Where you want to aim for is about 100, 120 mil at the absolute most. You don't go anything. So don't come through and put wider skirting boards because if you go too wide, what they'll start to do is they'll detract from the modern appearance and they'll start to move into the Federation look, okay? Federation era had the very wide skirting boards. So aim for about 100, 120. Keep it very simple, just a very square profile. So there's no need for you as renovators to go and buy all these elaborate profiles with all the twists and turns. You don't need that. Keep it really simple. Just do a plain square skirting board. Um, it'll look better. It'll look more modern. So just a square profile like that. Okay. So I can get going. Yeah, thanks. All right, install new light switches. So you're just going to be going through with dealing with old Nanny and Poppy's houses where they were once light wh white switches and just over time they've become um, beige or whatever just through age. So you just go through. Don't ever take these things off yourself. You always have to get an electrician in to basically change power points and light fittings. This is not an option for you. So make sure you come in. So you buy these at Bunnings. They're like 4 to $5 each light switch. Um, very easy. It can just instantly fresh up the property. Um, there's a lot of cream light switches too with these older houses, a lot of cream. So you just you're coming in, you're substituting for a crisp white, a bright white PowerPoint and light switch. So install the light switches and also PowerPoint. So again, you're going to come through over time. People paint and they spill paint over the old PowerPoint plates and things like that. So you just want a property, you want to present your property in a way that is just nice and fresh. So again, your electrician will come in, they'll change it over. Quite often, a lot of properties don't have enough PowerPoints. Have you ever seen that? We just go through and they've only got one PowerPoint in a room. You want to put a nice lamp or whatever. So quite often, I'm installing extra points as well. And it's very easy for the electrician while they're coming in. So you make sure you, this is, you identify the scope of work for the electrician, you know, change the, change the power points, change the light fittings, install extra power point to lounge room, that sort of stuff, very easy. So installing extra power points can definitely add some value as well. Um, look, there's different power points on the market. You can get all these really slick ones now, ones that illuminate. You don't really need to do that. Um, Obviously, as you start to move up into more expensive properties, it is better to have nicer power points. Um, but for most of you, you're just going to be using the standard white. Um, all of this sort of stuff, guys, you buy from Bunnings. I live at Bunnings. Um, and, you know, so instead of shopping at Gucci, I just shop at Bunnings. Um, so, yeah, I go shopping there. Bunnings are absolutely fantastic. You know, I've tried to get a trade discount with them for all of our students. Just can't get it, unfortunately. But we, as soon as the new Woolworth store is... Um, underway we're going to make contact with the new uh, Woolworths, Woolworths competitor so we're hoping we can do a deal with you because um, you know Bunnings is a great shop to place and all this sort of stuff they always have them in stock and they're just so cheap it's not funny um, you'll pay for you know four dollars thirty eight I think I paid for my recent powerpoints okay Improve lighting within a property. You're going to be going through a lot of unrenovated properties where it's just got dark and gloomy lighting, just no, like very small windows, just dark spaces. And so if you can improve lighting within a property, it will definitely go, it will definitely help you achieve that overall look of being lighter and brighter and bigger, okay? So you're just trying to get as much light into the property. So don't underestimate the power of putting things of like extra lighting under the kitchen bench, under bathroom vanities, mirrors, you know, having lights above the mirrors, all that sort of stuff does add true value to a property property. Okay, add skylights. You're going to be going through properties like this. You can see no skylight. Can you see what the difference of a skylight makes? Skylights are very cheap. Um, for these little dome lights, you typically don't need council approval for that. What you do need council approval for is the larger skylights where you're sort of like, you know, heading into like a meter or whatever. Then you may need um, council approval. But is that an exempt and complying development or is it a full DA? exempt and complying. So that's where you get approval in, in as little as two weeks or less. Most councils for exempt and complying are two, week or two weeks or less. Okay, you can see here, an average sort of room, you know, this is not a bad room, it's certainly not a room that really needs to be renovated, but it is somewhat a little bit dark and gloomy, and you can see just by adding a couple of skylights, it's, and see how it's illuminated that room? On my very first renovation, 
I did exactly this. Unfortunately, I didn't, I didn't take a lot of pit- pictures of my early pro- um, my properties because I didn't ever think I'd be public speaking and I'd kick myself now because I had so many good examples. But on my very first project, um, I literally did this on a roof cavity. I installed a, skull, a, sc- uh, sc- a couple of skylights and I actually got water views. Um, so that bumped. So then I was able to sell the house as water views. Like you had obviously had to look out the attic window to get them, but that doesn't matter. I still sold it as with water views. So, you know, you can see here, dark, gloomy, just by putting a skylight in. And they're so cheap. Like skylights are so inexpensive. You can buy them from the hardware. Bunnings sell them. Very quick, very easy to install. A good handyman should be able to do this for you. Um, otherwise, a builder. Okay, upgrade the fixtures and fittings. Now, there's going to be heaps of opportunity for you as renovators to pretty much come into a lot of properties you're going to be dealing with, whether it's got an old stove, old cooktop, they've just got an old sink, um, old bath, old vanity. So you, what you're going to do is you're going to be taking out the old and in with the new, okay? So you're going to be doing a lot of this. This is your shopping list. There's a template in the manual, which is your shopping list. Um, so this is all sort of stuff that you can start to do. From the time you sign that contract, you've committed to buy the contract, start going into shopping mode. And this is where your property inspection checklist comes into play because you've just gone through and you've just basically identified what it is that you need, what are all the items. So as you go room by room, you'll say... Um, you'll see this old stoke sink. Now, we know that's got to go, right? If you walk to a property and you saw that sink, you would assume that has to go, correct? Yes. Yep, good. We're all on the same page, which is good. Um, so what you want to do is you want to go through when you're in the kitchen looking at that sink, on your property inspection checklist, you'll be ticking replace kitchen sink. So when it comes to your feasibility, when you sit down at your computer, when you get home and you can actually start plugging in some figures, when you come to the kitchen section, you know you've probably got to allocate two or three hundred dollars, whatever it may be, for a kitchen sink. So that's why that property, is, well, some of these things I'm telling you, you might think, oh, that's a bit of a drag, another thing to do. But they're all necessary things to get you through the process, okay? So sinks, old taps, old toilets, you're going to replace the fixtures and fittings. Okay, install new plasterboard. You're going to be coming through a lot of houses where just over the time people have moved in and out they've been scuffed they're just beyond repair so new plasterboard does actually um, give the appearance of you know a new house makes it fresh um, everything's nice and straight plasterboard is pretty cheap uh, in the scheme of things so um, if in doubt get some quotes in see what it's going to cost quite often you can spend more time trying to patch and repair things and they still don't look right you could have just ripped them out sometimes you can actually come in with plasterboard and you can actually instead of ripping all the wall out chipping out all the old wall or whatever, the, the lime cement or whatever it may be, you can actually just come in and sheet straight over. One big mistake that a couple of um, students have said to me they were going to do is, you know, having like a brick house, like brick internal walls that are brick, and they're going to come in and put plasterboard straight over. That is a big mistake, okay? If you've got brick walls internally, what you want to be doing is rendering them, not plasterboarding, because brick always has higher perceived value than plasterboard, Okay. All right, but it's quick, it's easy, it goes up. A um, little random tip for you when your plasterboard is going in, particularly your ceilings, you want to ask your uh, plasterers to laser level the ceiling, okay, to make sure that the levels are dead straight with your ceiling. Otherwise, you, that might be slightly off. It doesn't matter. Even if it's only just out by that much, you can notice it. A lot of double brick in Perth. Yep. And the problem we've got is we've done this three or four times and had the same problem is we put the, obviously, the set, the white bit for people in Perth. White set, yeah. Yep, over the, the brick, and you've got to wait three to four months before you can paint it, because otherwise... There's a new product on the um, pro- uh, market. I th- think Dulux made it, make it, and basically you can now paint within 24 hours. It's called... Um, Render, render paint or something like that. So if you Google Dulux, they've actually now got a paint where you can paint render. So normally with render, you have to wait at least four weeks for curing. The longer, the better. And Dulux have just developed a new product. I'm not sure how long it's been on the market, but it's only recent, where you can now paint literally the next day after you render. It's got a special thing that traps the water so you can't get out. So it means as renovators, it's beautiful for you because you can basically start the, the painting painting. So I use that product in January for my 14-day reno. Okay, now just with the plasterboard, see that image there where um, I was about to do a really dumb thing there. I was about to press my um, laser pointer on this computer here, right down the bottom. Um, sometimes I'm smart, sometimes I'm not. Um, so what, you know, what people love is this effect where they basically follow the, the line of the ceiling, basically of the rafters, and so people really love that, that just obscure plaster work. So um, sometimes you'll find that as renovations um, over time, people do this. Actually, if I can even get you help. 
text that would be good. Um, where you've got a house, a room, and you know, it, you've got a pitch roof like that. So quite often people's instant reaction is just to go straight across because that's what everybody does in most cases. But if you can actually follow the line of the ceiling, you can actually get quite substantial head height up there if you can do it, okay? So it may mean that you might have to do a little bit more um, timber battening and bracing and whatever it may be of the roof, but that can always look really nice. My experience of seeing people in open for inspections, just one thing that I've observed is that people love the dormer windows and they love the, um, the rake ceilings and things like that. There's just something architectural about them that people love. So I've always noticed they're the properties that tend to attract a lot more interest, seem to have more buyers. It's just a personal observation. Okay, replace old door handles. You're going to be coming through and it's got old gold handles. So I think with any renovation, nothing, don't ever go gold, guys, okay? Um, even though it sounds great, it doesn't look so great. So what you want to always be aiming for is this sort of look, which is the um, either the polished chrome or the satin chrome handle. Silver, silver all the way. Lighter colours also go nicer with um, the silver fittings and fixtures. So Bunnings, in fact I've actually got, um, so, sorry Julie can I get you just to run down, down in the box over here I've actually got a sample of the door handles. Just when it comes to door handles guys you can really um, spend a lot of money on door handles and there are other times where you don't. Um, I shop for all my door handles at Bunnings and I'm just going about to drag out from one of my boxes um, a classic example of door handles. Um, you would have seen a video that I did maybe a couple of months, some of you will have it, some of you won't, about fake clones. Did most of you see that with the basins and things like that? Um, you can get two identical door handles that look almost the same, yet one of them can be $40 and the other one can be $200. So I would say always go to Bunnings and buy your door handles. Um, there's a shop here in, in, in Leichhardt um, that specifically just sells door handles and they've got some beautiful door handles, but you go in and you'll pay $200 for a door handle that looks literally literally identical, the same for 40 bucks in Bunnings. So that's what's called a fake clone. You can buy fake clones of everything, basins, taps, tiles, door handles, um, door stoppers. There's so many fake clones around and that's what you need because that's you'd be better off spending your money there rather than... So this is it here. Sorry, Jules, if I can get you to open that. Um, um, yeah, if you, this is where you can, if the money that you save there, like, you know, most houses have five or six doors. If you went and bought those $200 doors, that's $1,200 you've just spent on door handles. Or you can go to Bunnings and buy six, spend $200. You're $1,000 up to spend that $1,000 somewhere else, add some bang, some wow feature somewhere else for that. So can you see what I'm saying there? So be careful, like, start to become really frugal spenders with your money because, um, I mean, I get a designer look all the time for my properties and yet I've bought all my designer items at a budget price because a lot of them are fake clones. So these are the handles from Bunnings that I always buy. Even on my two, you know, my $2 million house that I'm building right now that will have $40 handles. Okay, so I'm going to pass these around. So that's where you don't need to spend copious amounts of money on little simple things like this. Thanks, Jules. Pass them around. Um, can we find the two basins too, Jules? Somewhere other at the back. I'm going to show you um, while we're talking about fake clones, I'm going to bring two basins down just to demonstrate this point. Question. Sorry, John. Do you usually go in a property for those style door handles? Because I own from residential properties, I only know the the round doorknobs here in, in Australia. Yep, you can go either. Like what you want to aim for is the silver um, as opposed to gold. So yeah, look, I personally, just my personal preference, my cookie cutter template is the straight bar handle rather than the, the round ones, but it's, it's up to you. I just personally feel those ones look better. So they're you more use contemporary. them on low budget as well as high budget? Don't do any high budget handles, no, they're all... No, I mean, I mean um, high value properties. You yeah, low and high, I use the same, 40... A buyer's not going to come through and go, oh, Cherie spent $200 on these handles, they look really expensive, I'm going to pay an extra $400 per door for that, they're not going to do that. They just want something that looks nice and neat and that's where you definitely don't need to spend money. But you spend money on this style door handle, whereas you could get a cheaper door knob. Yeah. But you still... Uh, are you oh, you're saying this one's forty dollars? Maybe going a twenty dollar one? Yes. Oh, this is like pretty much the yeah. You're not going to get much for twenty dollars. If you can find a twenty to one, twenty dollar one that looks just as good, then go for that one. No, I mean it doesn't look the same, but it c cuts your price. You got to. It's got to be a total look. Your projects have to look consistent in every way, shape, or form, and your objective is to make them look modern, okay, contemporary. Okay. So you got to choose fixtures and fittings that are, are contemporary in nature. And I personally feel those door handles as they're going around. Do you agree those door handles that are going around that you that the, those that you see that they look modern? Yes. They look nice. Yes. 
Yeah, low budget. See these two basins with my trusty girls? Um, see these two basins? This is a classic example of fake clones. So some of you would have seen the video where I demonstrated this. Who hasn't seen the fake clone video? So maybe Jules, can you put that on my list just to send it to everybody again in this group? So some of you will get it twice. I trust that's okay. Okay, one of these basins is a cheap um, import from China and one of these basins is from Italy. One basin is $70, the other basin is $1,000. Can you guess which one is the more expensive? Cheap, is this the cheaper or the more expensive? More expensive. More expensive, and that's the cheaper one? Yes, that's right. Okay. But as a friend of it, is it all that obvious? Oh, well, there you go. You cheated. All right. Um, I suck the lab one so I don't confuse myself. Um, so basically, like they look very similar, don't they? Yeah. All right, that is a classic example of a fake clone, okay? I've just showed you the door handles that are a fake clone. A lot of suppliers, when you go into your PC items, your suppliers for these sorts of things, what you should say to them, look, is if you see something that you really like that's expensive like this, I'd say, okay, um, I really like that, but do you have another budget version of that, like a cheap budget version that looks similar, like a I say a fake clone of that at a much cheaper price? Or you go and you like say, okay, this is the sort of basin I want. There's no way I'm paying $1,000. So off you trot and you go hunting for a cheap little shop like that that you're going to get those sorts of ones that aren't the best quality, um, but they still look the same. The difference between these two products, can anybody pick the difference? Apart from the size, like they're marginally sim um, different in size, and they are the same colour. Um, but can you, can you tell what the difference is here? Yeah, it's the lines. This is more sculptured. Okay, architecturally, this is a, the lines are a lot more defined, whereas that's a little bit more loose. Okay, it's not as structured. Who cares? All right, if you're doing a low-budget cosmetic runner, do you think, you know, Joe and Sally are going to care? And they're not going to pay you an extra $2,000 on your house because that basin looks more sculptured. So that's a classic example of fake clones. And you can get them on eBay as well. Um, this is where those, like, start shopping at those dodgy places. Um, <laughs> the, you know, the shops in the outer suburbs and those little ones that you're probably a bit too scared to even venture into, um, they're classic. I mean, that basin that Chad took, you know, clearance, a uh, 30, uh, 100 and whatever it was, $162 basin that I picked up just a few days ago for $30. So what I tend to do is I come across these sorts of things. So we'll leave those out during the break so you can touch and feel and have a look at them. But keep it eyes peeled out for these sorts of bargains because they exist everywhere. Okay. Uh, this might be a silly question. No but question's when you a silly go, one. <laughs> when you go shopping for all those little doorknobs and basins, is that true? Do you pick that up yourself and bring it to the builders or do the builders no, go yeah. pick that up? No, I buy that. That's And as renovators, you'll do all of that because no, if you get question. the builder to do it, you're paying them their time. That's right, the okay. fiddly time consuming part for a builder is the cosmetic fit out. And as renovators, that's all within your skill level and you're to do that yourself because nobody will, but I don't care what the builder says, a builder will not shop around and negotiate, negotiate and haggle as much as what you you will as a property developer. That's a reality. Um, do you have a set of doors you would normally use? Yep, it's all in my cookie cutter template. You've got all of these details. Yep, all itemised. It's in your manual. Hi, Sherry. Hey. Um, just, yeah, I'm doing the buy and hold strategy, yep. and I actually put those same sinks in one of my from Bunnings, the thirty dollars yep. ones. But I'm concerned about. Um, because they look the same now and the property's brand new, mm -hmm. but how will they look in a couple of years' time? Will, will a $30 sink obviously will scratch a lot more? And Would you not recommend? Cause a $30 I put it, sink I doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> Even if it's 30 bucks, I would just get somebody in, a plumber in for half an hour, cost you $50 to replace it in five years' time. It's, okay. Yeah. I'd be worried about that if it was a more expensive, like a thousand dollar sink, then yeah. But for low budget items, you've got to expect with low budget items too, lower quality, at some point they're going to have to be replaced as well. But most of those, like if you feel, if Chad's good enough to let you fill him up with that sink, um, you can feel it's hard. It's like, it's a pretty, I had to carry the things out of Bunnings. It was pretty heavy, so it's not a flimsy sink by any means. Okay. Okay, um, in terms of adding value, low budget, low budget cosmetic renos, add window locks, okay? So very quick and very easy to do. When you sell your property, this is what you put on your selling, like your selling cards, on your features and benefits list. You put window locks to every single door. Very cheap and very easy to do. If you get a good handyman, they can install this for you very easily. Hi, Shri. Um, Just quickly, there's a seconds. Do you buy from seconds places or anything Sometimes, like that? Sometimes, but not often. Yeah. Because there is a place out at Smithfield yep. and there's, 
you can get kitchens, you can yeah, get heaps all of sorts things. of stuff and really it's a scratch. Yeah, and I talk about that in step number seven in terms of where to get your materials for wholesale price. Yeah, we'll cover all of that. Thank you. Um, add a security alarm to the system, okay? So um, what I tend to do is I'm going to add a security alarm to the system. Um, I won't put it back to base. I'll just put a normal one that they can upgrade. They can take the optional extra to upgrade if possible. Okay, utilise spare space. Now, um, you're going to go through on properties that are underutilised internally as well. So there's opportunity for you as renovators to come in and utilise dead space. So if you look at this image here, I mean, this kitchen has would have very low perceived value. Would you agree with that? Because there's not many cabinets there. By coming in and actually adding by utilising that space above and to the sides there, it's instantly increased the value of that property through having a higher perceived value. So make sure you do that. And look for um, ways to utilise space in every way, shape or form, under the stairs, um, under other things. Just There's all sorts of ways, nooks and crannies. Um, in my current project, I'll show you how I've been able to utilise the space, even in the roof cavity for roof storage, okay? I've put a safe in there, all sorts of things. So you'll be amazed that when you go looking where you you can find some space in a property. Okay, add storage wherever practical. Storage is the number one bane of most buyers. We, the reality is we all collect lots of stuff in our day. We're all hoarders in, in one way, shape or form as much as we probably don't want to be. But storage is a big issue because a lot of properties don't have storage, particularly in the inner city locations. So look for storage. I mean, here you can see just some creative creative little ways. I mean, I wouldn't, if I was selling the property, I wouldn't put all that horrible stuff there. It looks horrible. If I was selling this property, I would take all of those books out and I just put some nice light white candles candles lit up to make it look nice um, but things like here where they've squeezed in extra storage through there it all adds value even here like even going to Ikea Ikea is such a fantastic shop if I die I want to come back and be Ikea right but um, I live I shop there my whole renovation that I just did in that off commercial office um, 10 days ago I bought literally everything from Ikea. So when I show you those photos, you'll be blown away because it's so cheap. Like, yeah, the quality's not so great, but you know, the, generally it will last you quite a few years. So um, they sell all these sorts of things. Like you can book, pick up a bookcase like this for like $49 in Ikea um, and you just basically recess it into the wall. So I think of all those sort of low ways to, to get some wow factor um, for those, particularly those low budget cosmetic renos. Um, this is a this is the kitchen that I did last year in Pimble. This is a big renovation I did in Pimble. So what I did is here I, another creative way of thinking outside the square. On the other side of this wall, you can see it's clearly the kitchen. So most people's instant reaction would be to you know to bring that wall down, to jiprock that wall down. Would you agree with that? So what I did is I cut the wall out, so I made it into a usable area. This is obviously the dining room, so I made it into a usable area where they could actually slide the plates and you know food through under the under the whatever you want to call this thing the serve servery yeah servery and by takes so I extended the bench the stone out uh, an extra you know whatever it was half a meter and by extending it out I was able to get all this under bench storage for things like your formal dinner plates and cutlery and things like that so there's lots of ways you can squeeze in storage without cluttering the space I'm um, just my personal opinion look it depends on the value of the property if you're starting to notch into more expensive properties wall hung cabinets always look nice because they're not positioned on the floor they actually make the space look larger as well not applicable to $300,000 houses that you're renovating in Wagga Wagga, but certainly applicable for more expensive properties, okay? All right, install underfloor heating. Now, this will depend on the value of the property. If you're doing a higher value renovation, cosmetic reno, underfloor heating absolutely adds value to a property. It's not that expensive. It is expensive, but not overly expensive. So you've just got to determine uh, what is the expectation in your suburb and is it going to be worth the investment? Okay, install insulation to walls and ceilings. Again, higher, more expensive properties, it will be an expectation that you have insulation. Lower budget properties, probably not so relevant. I have a general rule with renovations, only spend money on things where it can be seen. Okay, so always keep that as your number one priority. But sometimes if you're renovating a $2 million house, for example, the current house that I'm renovating, it would be a big mistake of me not to put insulation in a $2 million house. It would be a big mistake not to put underfloor heating in a $2 million house. So you've just got to keep in mind what your spend is relative to the value of the property. Is this going? Uh, one comment about underfloor um, heating. heating. Um, with people with asthmatic problems, um, they pro might be better with um, heating low to the floor because the heat air, hot air rises 
and the dust particles can pose a problem. Yeah, and actually, um, so I'm right, that's great, thank you. That's actually another reason why I don't use carpet. So when I don't use carpet in my renovations, what I do is I always do timber floorboards right across our house, regardless of whether it's a single story or a double story house. And what I do in my styling, I bring in the big, I bring in the big rugs to dress it up. So what I do is through my renovations, I market my house as an allergy free home because there's no carpet and there's no window furnishings which attract dust and mite and things like that. So if you're really smart, you can minimise your cost and sort of make something appear better than what it really is, really, yeah. Okay, add shelving and benches in the garage. Okay, it's another way. Um, create a specta spectacular hallway. So you just got to keep in mind that the hallway is the first impression to a property. So sometimes as renovators, um, what happens over time in quite a lot of the cases is that you have a hallway into a property and over time people get lazy and they just, instead of ripping out or trying to patch exactly what I said, you know, 10 minutes ago, they'll come in and they'll just sheet over the existing plasterboard. So sometimes you can actually do it, you go in and buy properties where they've actually just put a couple of layers of plasterboard, whatever it may be. And this particularly happens on the ceilings, more prevalent on the ceilings and the wall. So if you find you've actually got a very skinny hallway, like you don't ever want a hallway less than 900 mil, I, I believe. Anything below 900 is too skinny and it'll actually make the property feel crammed. So you want to try and get as large a hallway as possible. So sometimes just have a look, see if you can actually strip away potential layers on those really old properties that you're going to be dealing with. Um, thank you. Install an internal children's play area. Now, as per who's got kids? Okay, how ugly are your children's toys all over the house? So yeah, as parents, you're gonna, as renovators, you're gonna be targeting families. So what you wanna do is maybe even think about in your design, can you install a children's play area of some sort? And maybe even just a vacant room, like a great way to do this is if you've got a floor plan, you've got your bedrooms here, got your bedrooms like that, and you might have another room there, blah, 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 and then this is all um, open plan, you know, living dining room where you've got your kitchen along there and blah, 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 maybe bath here. If you're really smart with the design, instead of, um, you can actually take out the walls and, you know, even put like, a, like glass sliders, very similar to what I've done in my current project, so those doors can bank back and that can be like a dedicated children's area, it can be a children's area, it can be a media room, it can be whatever, you, you know, it wants. So you should have got to try and design, when you're doing any structural renovations, try and design the places to be flexible rooms, so that can be anything, that can be a children's play area, um, a media room, whatever. Okay, change the use of a room to something better. Okay, this is um, when I bought the house, this is the barn on my property. I thought, okay, I don't have really a use for a barn. Barn doesn't add a lot of value in the inner city. So what I did is I converted the barn to a commercial <laughs> office. <laughs> Tip for you, don't get a very quick reno um, AV guy, all right? What did he say? Beer cellar. Beer cellar, oh, okay, cool, yeah. Cave room for the guys, you can lock them in there. Um, so what you want to do is um, I've converted, I've taken that barn, so obviously it was that, very unusable, and I've converted it into um, a commercial office space or it can be a self-contained granny flat. So when it came time to actually, when it comes time to selling that property, if I was ever going to sell it, um, what I'd do is I'd put those selling cards on the wall, which is basically commercial office. I'd put a second cut underneath, granny flat, um, in-laws retreat, um, parents, you know, or boys cave room. So I would actually give people the, I would, I would basically paint the picture of what that room can become. Okay, sunrooms are another classic example. A lot of properties have sunroom, particularly all the Queensland people in the audience, um, a lot of sunrooms in Brisbane. And so can you do something better with those sunrooms? So quite often with a lot of my Brisbane graduates, they've had a, um, They've had a property where, so, you know, sort of similar thing where in Brisbane, you know, you've got your staircase sort of leading up to the front of the property. You might have your entry here and they've got a bath, you know, a bedroom. Sorry, they've got a sunroom at the front here. So that's always been like a sunroom. And then they've got a, uh, you know, bedroom through there. So it'll be a bed. There'll be another room through here, bed, blah, 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 blah. So what you can do, you can actually come through the sunroom. And I've sort of said to some of my students, why don't you knock out part of the wall there and make that into what, renovators? Uh, not so much an ensuite to the front of the house, big, big walk-in robe. Okay, so that's where some rooms give you the perfect opportunity to do that. So that's giving your rooms a higher and better use because somebody is going to value a big walk-in robe much higher value than potentially a little sunroom, okay? So try and think about that in your structural renos. 
or even your cosmetic renos. Um, even things like your dining room these days, the dining room is almost a dying area of the house. In some suburbs, it's an expectation. In some suburbs, it's not. So take away that dining room. Could you potentially convert a bedroom? Could that become a bedroom? If you can squeeze in an extra bedroom into your layer, ooh, happy days. Okay, an extra bedroom in my suburb adds anywhere between two to $400,000 in extra value. So can you make something better than what it really is? There is, when in terms of your due diligence folder, you will see, it doesn't matter what suburb you're from, it doesn't, you know, you can be in Lightning Ridge, property values will always be based on the number of bedrooms and the land size. So if you can squeeze in more bedrooms without sacrificing the quality of the house, so you don't ever squeeze in a bedroom and have this tiny little lounge room, okay? So you don't sacrifice other key spaces. Okay, give the property design a look and feel with wow features. So what wow features do is they, they get people emotionally excited about your property. You want emotional buyers because when it, when it comes to sale time, they're going to go to the auction not bidding with their heads. What is it? Their hearts, logic goes out the window, it flies, it just goes out, they lose all control. And it's because they're so emotionally connected. And how you get buyers emotionally connected to your property is by installing these little features throughout the house. They don't need to be expensive things, but little things that make them walking through their property going, oh, that, that looks really nice, I like that. Oh, I love that light, that looks beautiful. Ah, oh, you look good. Um, that sort of stuff. So that's what, that's what little things. So as you go through my site inspection this week, um, basically I have designed wow features. They may not be apparent to you, but I have put wow features in so that it, as they start to move through the house, they're going, oh, I like that. Oh, look, like I'm nice. I like that. So things are being placed in that house for a reason. And I'll take you through those. Okay. You know, things like wall cutouts, very simple. Like have a look at this picture here. Is this room nice? Yeah. What is it? It's from a magazine. It's from a magazine, yeah, it's not from mine. But what is it that makes that house look nice? It's the three lights. So don't think wow features need to be some expensive plasma screen or some thing that flashes and does whatever, right? They can be really simple things. But that's things that just catch your eyes and make you go wow. And in this case, it's just three drum lights. I guarantee you they're probably like $150, $200 drum lights each. Drum lights are very cheap, expensive, really nice. So that's where they've spent probably 500 bucks on those three drum lights and it makes it look designer. Wall cutouts, see these little things? They can always look, because what the wall cut, it's very easy to do in the construction process. Um, and what they do is they just give you probably that little designer look, just a little, little, little bit more architectural. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to get stuck into now the general internal. So we've just looked at some of the, the very broad cosmetic things that you can do, and we're going to now start to go drill down at specific areas of a property. Guys, there's that light. I found it on Ikea for you during the break. So that light is 169. It's a fairly nice light, would you, would you say? Um, low budget. And what I did is actually got a, a can of white spray paint and I actually just sprayed this section here and it came up absolutely amazing. So you can do some really creative things with the lights from Ikea. All right, number 26, raise the ceiling to gain more head height. So we're going to move through this section fairly quickly now with these 140 ways. Raise the ceiling to gain more head height. Over time, as I said, people get lazy. They say, don't rip the ceiling, we'll just go straight in underneath. So I've been pleasantly surprised many, many times where I've ripped down a ceiling, owner find another ceiling, so I ripped that down and I found another ceiling. So quite often I've been able to get, you know, an additional six, 700 mil of ceiling height. Your objective, obviously, the higher the ceiling, the higher perceived value you as well. A lot of more expensive houses that you go into, they've got much higher ceilings. Standard is 2.4, so you go into some properties, they're like three metres, three and a half, the, and it just makes the property look so much nicer. So don't underestimate those sorts of things. You'll find as renovators, you'll uncover all, all sorts of things in terms of nice little hidden surprises. Uh, one day I knocked out a wall and I found it was just beautiful. It was this, this old cooker that was sitting and um, it had all the antique pots. And I just went, hallelujah, I won the lotto. And um, so anyway, I was, you know, carting this thing. I was being so, oh, so precious with it. Like, don't, don't knock this stuff, guys. Like my laborers carrying it out to my car or whatever. And I took it to the antique shop and I thought, I swore I thought I was going to get like 50 or 100 grand for this original thing. And they said, I'll give you 20 bucks, love. <laughs> and so I'm like, ah! <laughs> I busted my guts trying to get it up the side. And anyway... So anyway, you, you come across all sorts of things, you know, pennies and all sorts of stuff. 
It's really interesting when you flip the floorboards are a classic one. If you want to know the age of a property, quite often you rip the old floorboards or the old carpet out. They used to always line the, the floors with newspaper. And you see Sydney House, $10,000. Like, and you go, ah, oh, you've only just bought property back then. So, anyway. All right, so raise the ceiling so you can see that obviously the higher up you can go, the nicer your property is going to look from an architectural perspective. Um, utilize the roof space. I do this quite often. So, don't underestimate the power of you utilizing roof cavities on my current site everybody that comes through that I'm going to show you how I've been able to do that so I was able to get a first floor extension now look at the two pictures they're both the same house one is obviously when I bought it and one currently during renovation um, the house actually the roof actually looks like it's a higher pitch doesn't it hasn't been changed. I just took the terracotta tiles off and I just replaced it with my standard cookie cutter um, colour bond. And obviously you can see through there, see just there how I've put a first floor extension to the rear. So I purposely set it back 100 mil below the ridge line. The ridge line is basically that line there. Set it 100 mil below the ridge line and I was able to go out the back. Now see how, and then what I did is I put a section 96 in later to put the two dormer windows because they're very controversial. Either people will love them or hate them. So I put the original development an application through without them so that dorm that first floor extension couldn't be seen that breeze through council no issue and then I came back put the section 96 in to put the two dormers in and that went through no I got one objection but it was you know got less than four so that went through relatively easy as well so don't underestimate because that's how you can go above the FSR allowed in your um, your council because it doesn't negatively impact other people um, Quite often here, I've been able to get some renovations where, again, when sometimes you're going to buy houses with where the roof is quite a high pitch, um, it tends to be more prevalent when you're renovating in the inner city locations. So if you've got a high pitch, they're absolutely great ones to utilise. You can actually make them like a parents' retreat, um, like a little lounge room adjoining the main bedroom. So this happened on my first renovation where um, somebody had actually knocked a little hole in the wall. It was actually just like a little hole like that. And I was pretty much going... Like that, like trying to look in the hall and I, it was like pretty dark, I couldn't see. So I, we had to take it out anyway, like we had to basically cut a square. So when the plasterer went to cut a square, we discovered this massive big room like right behind, which was basically in the roof cavity. So I was able to create an in-laws retreat with a massive big lounge room just by coming in and sheeting um, the underside of the roof. So... Yeah, don't underestimate. This is one of my projects where, uh, my Bradford Street project, where I was able to go up into the roof cavity. So sometimes you can't get a staircase, but what you do, these ones are perfect for, you know, those pull down attic ladders. So I put this attic ladder in, and so I took it from a, um, this was originally a three bedroom house, I converted it into a five bedroom house. The fifth bedroom was a guest bedroom, and the fifth bedroom really was for guest so when your mother-in-law or something comes over you just shove her up in the attic <laughs> and close the ladder <laughs> just make sure it never comes down <laughs> okay <laughs> like that movie you know what's that movie where they, they shove somebody in the attic um what are <laughs> yeah problems what do we do with problems we lock them in the attic <laughs> okay all right just joking guys all right um, what do you think of coffers? You know, the raised ceiling. I thought you said back. coffins. Um, coffers. Coffers? Yeah. What's that? You know, where the ceiling's at 2.4 and then you raise up 2.7, you're 500 in or a metre in, then it goes up. And oh, you mean like a bulkhead? Yeah. A bulkhead, way, yeah. The whole thing's um, bulkhead right. are goods. Um, I mean, obviously, the less bulkheads, the better. Um, yeah, if you, I mean, quite often bulkheads, what you'll find is that, um, particularly when you're renovating houses, if you want to rough in something, like if you want to put suddenly air conditioning in a house that hasn't had it, like ducted air, you're going to have basically ducting and, and pipes running through the house. So that's where you have to build a bulkhead. So you just don't, it's okay. Is that what you mean? Like, is that what you mean, bulkheads? No? No, there's it internally. You're talking about eaves? So where are you from? Where? <laughs> Perth. Oh, that explains it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, just pretend you've got a 2.4 um, ceiling. ceiling. Internally or externally? Internally. Yep. Okay, and you want to make it a 2.7, but you don't want to make the whole lot a 2.7. Yeah. Yeah. And so you, you come oh, in. Oh, yes. Okay. Is that what you call it? Coffers? I've never heard that. Has anybody else ever heard that or just, am I totally dumb? What do you call um, it? I don't call it anything. Um, oh. Yeah, just a raised ceiling, like well, a raised what, infill. That's what the plasterers call a it. A raised infill. Okay, well, there you go. You learn something every day. <laughs> I got that one. <laughs> All right. 
So yeah, no, they look really nice, particularly. So I know what you're saying. So what? Um, uh, what? What? what, what so what's your name? Craig. Graham. So what Graham's saying is, if you've got a ceiling, and if I'm understanding him correctly, where they go like that. Yeah. Okay. So I actually did one of those. I um, did some of those in my pinball project, but I didn't call them coffers though. Um, so basically, so that might be the techno. I'm going to risk going research that now, so I can start sounding like a professional renovator. Um, so. What um, they look nice, and particularly on more expensive properties. So if you're doing a low budget reno, um, you probably wouldn't go to the expensive because you have to batten it out and um, plasterboard work, painting, all that sort of stuff. Yes, exactly right. So where that where um, where that what he's saying is that um, if you if you if you raise that to there, then you'd have to sort of make good this area here. So if you actually do the infill, I, I just normally sort of call that like an infill, um, but I'm sure coffers is the correct term. So. Um, if, you, if you take it to there, that means you don't have to make good that area there. So that's particularly important if you're dealing with like brick walls or whatever, where you change the ceiling height, then you'd have to come in and render and white set, whatever it may be. All right. Add a bedroom by altering the internal layout. So guys, if you can try and squeeze in an extra bedroom into your floor pan, it's definitely a way to increase the value, particularly on low-budget cosmetic renos. But don't, don't squeeze an extra bedroom without sacrificing the quality of the other space. That's a big mistake. So this is, um, I'm going to show you this floor plan as renovators. Um, I can squeeze an extra bedroom into this floor plan. So potentially, where would you squeeze an extra bedroom? Have a look at this floor plan. Okay, so hands up. Who's saying the living room? Who's saying the dining room? Yes, the dining room. So as a renovator, if this was a low-budget cosmetic renovation, what I'd do is I'd relocate the laundry into the so the bathroom into the laundry. All your water pipes and everything are there. Your, your water lines. So it makes sense to do that. Look how big the laundry is in comparison to the bath. This is the sort of floor plans you're going to be dealing with as a professional renovator. So I'd relocate the bath into the laundry, and I'd probably put the laundry behind a set of bifold doors, depending on which suburb it was in. Okay. And what I do is, so that would free up this space here. I would come through and take out that wall if it wasn't a load-bearing wall, and I'd relocate the dining up here. So I'd make it open plan living dining um, up through this section here. And what I would do is I'd get my um, carpenter to come put a timber stud wall through here, and I'd plasterboard that, and I've created bedroom three. So that's what you can do. So that would add value to a property by because you can now sell that it's not a two-bedroom house as a three-bedroom house that will have a much higher perceived value. So, things for you to look at. Alter and improve floor plans. Now, this is a big one for me. As a structural renovator, you're going to be finding that you are going to start doodling with floor plans. Your job is to basically buy houses with very disjointed layouts. The architectural planning was terrible, um, particularly from the post-war period. It was really, really bad. It was all about segmenting individual rooms. What people want these days doesn't matter what suburb they live in. Most people these days want open plan living. That's where you typically have your bedrooms to the front and you have open plan, open plan living, dining, kitchen areas to the rear. So um, one thing that I always do is I always grab floor plans from the agent's brochures for any property that I'm potentially looking at. Grab, grab the back of their brochure, go buy yourself a roll of tracing paper from Officeworks and what you do is you basically trace the outline of the building and you work within it. So start doodling with how you can change rooms around and that's all I've done. Over the last 10, 11 years, I've just been doodling on the back. So you sit on the lounge watching telly on Monday night, whatever it may be, just grab your floor plans out and start doodling, just trying to work out, trying to shuffle work rooms around. So um, if you've got a... Okay, <laughs> what am I doing? Oh, getting me stuck. All right, so if you've got a floor plan, has anybody got a floor plan here they want me to do at the moment? No? Okay. Yeah, you've got one ready to go? Oh, okay. How long is this workshop? Okay, uh, we got anybody a single residential? Has anybody got in the audience got now? Right, yeah, you got one? On the internet? Uh, yeah, is it on domain? Yeah. Do you um, want to do this exercise, guys? Yeah. Okay. Number 18. One second. Eighteen. Number 18 and the Mayata, M-A-Y. So M-A-Y? No, M-Y. Yep. R-T-L-E. Uh, street. Yep. Yeah, Metal Street in Cloverly Park. Yeah, Cloverly Park. Yeah, in South Australia. Is this your house or a house you're looking at? 
Nice. Look at this. Yeah, how's it looking? At? I just got to yeah. go make a plane trip, all right? Uh, yeah, actually, that's, uh, that one is in the uh, regeneration area. Okay. It's called, uh, yeah. Floor plan, that's the floor plan. All right. <coughs> so, you're going to get the agent's brochure. Thank you. That's about right, would you agree? And what's the, what's the thing in the middle? Pagola, we won't, yeah, yeah, Pagola, we worry about that. <coughs> We're not going to get that technical. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you've got to go through one for the next. Yep. So it's like that. Yeah. All right. <laughs> we don't want to do the exercise anymore. Oh, great. <laughs> All right, so with the floor plan, so you'd obviously have that floor plan on the back of a brochure, grab some tracing paper, overlay it onto, that's going to make it you know, easier for you to basically, so you don't have to do what I've just done there. So what I'm basically, first of all, what I do when I'm looking, and look, I'm not an architect, but I've, I can do almost what an architect does these days in terms of just the conceptual stuff, I'm not talking about all the CAD drawings, but what the first process is, you've got to identify the rooms that are right, okay? So we know in this particular layout, if I just scroll back to the, the, the bottom section, let's do the bottom half of this property first. Okay, so you know that you always sort of work around the entry area first. So we know according to that layout, does bedroom four look right? This is bedroom four here. Yeah. That's bedroom three. Yeah. Bedroom three we know is in the right location, right? What you want to do is you want to clump all your bedrooms together. That's called the sleeping zone. So there's somewhere, we'll, we will get to it here, but in somewhere that room there's called um, sleeping zone. So you conglomerate all the bedrooms together in an ideal layout and you always make sure there's a bathroom to serve as the bedrooms, okay? So that's called the sleeping zone. Um, if you, you've also got what's called a living zone, which is your open plan communal living areas. You've also got what's called the service zone. Your service zone tends to be your kitchen and your bathroom and your laundry, all those um, rooms that have all your service, your gas and your water lines. And then you've got your outdoor entertaining zone. Now, what's the, it's the patio out here? What zone is that called? That's the outdoor. So that is right, right? That, that, the patio is right. Bedroom four is right, okay? Because we know that we really can't do anything else apart from you know, convert it to a bathroom, so that looks right. Bedroom three looks right. The patio is right, so all of those are right. Now, this is right here, the entry. You don't really want to change that, so that is right. Now, this is currently a four-bedroom home, so it's a bit disjointed, right? You've literally got to walk through the whole house to get to the bedroom at the back. In order to get to the main bedroom, you've got to walk through the study first, so that's actually like that, right? It's a bit clumsy, would you say? This is a, pra this is a really good example of a very disjointed um, layout. So this is just a series of rooms and your job is to come in as a renovator and basically take this out. So what I'd be doing is I would be changing... All I know is that at this point, I would be coming in. I know they're fine. I've got a, my issue is here, I'm going to take out a bedroom. I'm going to take out a bedroom from there. So it means I've got to squeeze an extra bedroom in. So my instant reaction is to basically convert the... I know the lounge is going to go as a lounge. So I'm going to basically enclose that right... Um, basically at that right... Po no, sorry, Helen. I know I'm going to close the floor plan in here. See that wall? That's going to be closed in, so that's going to be closed in right here, and that's going to become bedroom, uh, potentially bedroom one. Could be bedroom one, bedroom two. In fact, I'd probably be inclined to make that bedroom two. Um, now, I've created, you've got a, a good size hallway on the, see the, how the property is quite wide, wide there? So what am I going to stick here, guys? Feature light. There would be a feature light going somewhere quite nice through that entry area there. Um, now, what I'm going to do is so got, I've got one, I've got one, two, I've got here. What I would be inclined to do is we've got a very small pokey bathroom through there. I mean, that bath, look at that bathroom. It's a nonsense bathroom, okay? So what I would do is I'd basically come through, I would put a bigger bathroom through here. Um, so I'd be creating a bigger bathroom through here to service bedroom two, three, and four. And what I would potentially do here, knock out all of that, knock out of all of that, I would be basically creating the main bedroom through here, bedroom four. And if, if space allowed, 
I'd be trying to build in an ensuite somewhere through there, like an ensuite where they walk through like that. So you always, if you've got small ensuites, you always push the door to one side. Okay. So you'd have a door like that. So you can maximise the bench space. If you put a door right in the middle, you've actually lost that, that ability. Um, um, or it could be a cavity door, yeah, cavity door, if it's just a normal timber stud, so that would be a bathroom potentially to service the main bedroom. Um, basically what I'd do is I'd relocate the dining and I would come through, would knock all of that out, I would put a galley style kitchen through here, or just a, a kitchen like that. It could even be, uh, so you could do a kitchen like that. I would actually put a nice little bifold window there to so you can pass stuff out into the patio. I would come through here. I would put a set of bifold doors through there. All right. And this would become my lounge, my dining room here. That leads nice, beautiful doors that lead out into the courtyard and the, basically the greater backyard. I'd put um, a... Uh, a concealed laundry behind a set of bifold doors and I put a linen press through there and then obviously have your, you know, your door going into that like that. All right? So what it's doing is your conglomerate, this is your sleeping zone here, okay? It's serviced by a bathroom. They never, you, when you have a ba bedroom, you always have to have a bathroom because people don't want to get up in the middle of the night to go to the toilet and have to go right down the other end of the house. So it's ticking the boxes in all that regard. This is your service zone here, like your kitchen. Um, and this is your living zone right here, and this is your outdoor entertaining zone. So do you see how easy it was for me to do that? So the more, this is what the beauty of doodling with floor plans in the back of the tracing paper. I can do this now. So what I do is I would do that, that concept. I'd muck around with it a bit more, and then I go to my architect and I say, look, Steve, this is what I'm thinking. Um, is this the along the lines of things? Like, take this away and see if you can improve it. And that's typically, so I don't have to have this massive big design inspiration meeting with my architect um, where I'm paying for time. So, um, yeah, the more you can do this, the better for you as renovators. And this is just practice. Practice makes perfect. That's all it is. Okay. Okay, I've got to move along. Right, so lots of notes there in your manuals about floor plans. There's some notes about um, sleeping zone. If you actually, if you watch, um, who's on the lifestyle? Li who watch, who's got Foxtel here? Okay, who watches the Lifestyle Home Channel? Okay, uh, you should be watching it because it's a really, really good channel. They've got heaps of renovation shows on. Um, we have it on the go in the office every single day. I'm on it these days, so um, uh, you, that's another good reason. <laughs> if you don't get enough of me here, then. Um, but you know, it's a really good show just for like all this sort of stuff. People knocking down walls, taking out, changing layouts, like all of this sort of stuff will help you become really good property developers. And the more you can understand and the more skilled you become at doing this, the more money you're actually going to save and not having to, to um, pay other people to design this sort of stuff for you. Okay. Um, there's actually a thing on, on, on Lifestyle. We will email blast this out to you, but I've actually done a thing with Flo uh, Foxtel on this very sleeping zone, living zone. So some of you may have seen it on TV. Has anybody seen that at the moment? No? Okay, cool. All right. 